I'm Eric from Longbox Review. I'm Peter from The Daily Rios, and this is episode 27 of Eric and Peter's Legion Project Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the 27th episode of the Legion Project Podcast. This is your host, Peter. And I am Eric, and Happy New Year to everyone. Please, please, Happy New Year. (laughs) Peter and I were talking uh, before we started recording, and oh my God, what a year, what a week this has been uh, at the time that we are recording this. 2020 is still lingering. Oh, horribly so, and we'll talk about one aspect of that, that spillover from 2020. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I, I, you know, 2021, New Year, but I'm sort of thinking the New Year really doesn't happen until March, because that's when everything kind of went downhill, right? That's true. March 2020, so that's what's crazy about for me. It's like, oh, we still got a couple, (laughs) we still got two more months. You know... You know the Gregorian calendar has had a good run. Uh, I think it's time that we we uh, we switched it up a little bit, and you know the new year starts in March. Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Well, we're here to talk about the twenty seventh issue of Legion of Superheroes. Uh, you know, kind of a wrap up to what we've been talking about for a while with the whole who is Sense Girl mystery going all the way back to issue 14, heck, going all the way back to issue one of this series with the Legion of Superheroes, Legion of Supervillains war and the outcome of that. Um, But as Eric mentioned, we we do have to talk about something that happened in the news lately um, because it it hits home to the Legion of Superheroes and to our podcast and to some of our discussions that we've been having on and off. Um. And that news was the uh, sudden and and sad death of artist creator Steve Lytle. Yeah, so he this, so this we got the news um, on January eighth. So that's yesterday, as of this recording, and uh, he died of a cardiac arrest, uh, as reported by his son on on uh, Steve's Facebook account. Mm-hmm. Age sixty one, Peter. Yeah, that's too young. Yeah. I mean, that's that's only 10 years older than myself. So <laughs> uh that's way too young. Yeah. And and you know, not to delve deeper into it, but I mean, uh, apparently also be brought on because of complications of being COVID positive. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, wow. His, that's his, that's unfortunate. His wife put that information out, I believe, on Facebook, so Oh. See, I w- I wondered about that, but but the stuff that I saw, and granted, I haven't I haven't delved into it, but um, I had I had not encountered that, so that's that's yeah, that's very sad. Yeah, I mean, it, it really it kind of when I heard about it the first time before I really knew any information other than than, than heart failure um, or something to do with the heart. You know, I, I've I've always kind of thought that creatives comic creatives you know because they live that that um Mm -hmm. freelancer life you know their health is always sometimes very poor um whether it's because they're they're so stationary because they're at their desk 12 hours a day uh maybe they don't have health insurance if they're freelancing um uh, but we see it a lot with a lot of creators you know they have health issues or something happens and they have to put up, uh, you know, some kind of fundraiser for their health. And, and, um, I mean, that was one of the first things that went through my mind when I saw it. I was like, uh, I hope it didn't have anything to do with like just the lifestyle that he had to leave, you know, lead or anything like that, you know? Um, 
Because they say, you know, you can't be stationary like that all day without taking breaks and without being, you know, you got to, you got to care for yourself, you got to care for yourself. But I mean, if it goes a little deeper than that, you know, obviously then it's nothing he could have done maybe. Yeah. I, I follow a lot of artists on Twitter and, uh, you know, without fail, every few months I see a, a, a resurgence of tweets from, from various artists talking about you know, how they need to either, either they need to be more active, um, or giving advice to other artists about being active and, 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 uh, you know, not being sedentary while pursuing their vocation. Hmm. A lot of celebrations though, for his life. I mean, I, I saw the tweet from Paul Kupperberg. Uh, they were collaborators on the Doom Patrol series back in the eighties for about three, four issues. A lot of people putting out, obviously, mentions about the Legion of Superheroes, other ones, commissions that they had received, uh, people dropping their favorite covers, whether it was from, like, Legion, Doom Patrol, Flash, classic X-Men, stuff that I've never seen before, Um, some original artwork here and there. Um, Yeah, there was a lot of outpouring, which was kind of nice to see for someone who... Um, is not really in the comics eye right now, I don't think, other than his own work. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but people saying how appreciative he was when they met him in person. And um, I think I saw someone tweet something. I'm going to paraphrase and get it wrong, but they said, you know, that he was such a talent. And, and, they brought up the whole, you know, his, his style was just too detailed for a monthly book. Um, whether that was, a uh, a pro or a con, you know what I mean? Like, like how much work didn't we get from Steve Lytle because he was such the, the consummate artist for himself, you know, and we've talked about that too. Yeah. His, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, I've even read his words from the Legion Companion book, talking about that very specific thing and and how he felt like he was letting down uh, himself and and his 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 readers, his fans, because of that. But you know, it was always it seemed to me that it was it was more about the quality of the work and and what he was trying to accomplish that was the more important thing. And I ha- and I agree with that. I think that's that is that is something that that uh, I appreciate about those those kinds of artists who who continually push themselves and strive to do to be better artists um, at the expense of you know maybe uh, more regular output I, I'm totally fine with that you mentioned you have uh, something you wanted to bring up uh, an article or an interview you read yeah when I was looking into this um, uh, I, I, I found a, an article that CBR put out uh, talking about a, a 2002 interview they did with with Mr. Mr. Lytle and I, I just thought it was apropos to our, obviously, our discussions about this book. Um, he said, uh, one of the greatest things about the Legion is the diversity of its cast. And I think that we've talked about this this notion before, uh, based on an, uh, uh, something out of the Legion Companion mm-hmm. book. Um, he continues, I like different characters for their unique qualities. There is an awkwardness about Brainiac 5 that makes him an endearing character, despite his vastly superior intellect. Timberwolf has a vitality and a potential for ferocity that makes him interesting. And uh, there is untapped complexity to, he says Valor here, but Monel that I only touched on in the story Back Home in Hell. I'd like to have the chance to develop the submerged contradictions that lie deep beneath his noble exterior. And then he says, laughing, and then there's Quizlet. (laughs) <laughs> which he would know since he created the character. Yeah. Well, that, you know, we talked about this before, but that's that's one of the, I think, one of the coolest things about Mr. Lytle's contributions, not obviously not just his art, but that he was very interested in the diversity of the cast of the Legion and had a hand in in coming up with, if not the, the look of the character, but maybe even the character itself, um, uh, you know, more alien looking, less human looking characters in, in the Legion. So I, I really appreciate that contribution. 
Yeah, I mean, he was, uh, as we discovered in our conversations, he was more than just a Legion fill-in artist. He was more than just a Legion cover artist. His run, even though it wasn't very long, was really important, and we're still feeling echoes of it in these later issues that we're reading, and I imagine we'll keep feeling echoes as we see new covers, you know, as we go on um, through through this volume, and uh, he certainly has a Legion history in books that we may never get to, you know, years, years from where we're reading. Um, yeah, it's just sad. It's, it's just a sad thing. Um, when they're older, it's one thing, you know, when, 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 when a Stan Lee or um, Denny O'Neill, you know, not that you want them to go, but when they're older, you under, you sort of understand time and, and mm. the body, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But something like this, it's like, hmm, it's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we used to always champion, go and meet your creators or reach out to them. Just say, if they're on Twitter or elsewhere, what they meant to you, you know, what their work meant to you. If you, if you're fortunate enough to be in a position to get commissions from them, uh, you have a piece of unique artwork and then, and you're also helping them out maybe in some small way that you don't realize, um, you know, conventions, who knows when we'll get back to that. So, uh, another way to do that is, is maybe just reach out and, and just sort of say, Hey, your work meant something to me. Um, pick up a book they're, they're creating, or if they're, if they have a Kickstarter or something like that. So, uh, cause yeah. Especially in our generation, you and I, you know, like the people we grew up with, the people that we love and that that help to formulate what we love about comics, they're another 10, 20, 30, 40 years older than us. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and we're old. (laughs) (laughs) So, no, just kidding. So it's like, you know, it's probably going to be happening more and more and. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we we should dedicate this episode to Mr. Steve Lytle. Well deserved. Um okay. So from there um don't have much preamble. We did get a, a mention on Twitter from Sergeant America. Um I believe you know he follows you, I think, I don't know if he mm-hmm. follows both. Asking about our reaction, speaking of artwork, Legion of Art, Legion artwork, uh, to the Future State Legion book done by Riley Rosmo that will be coming out um, this month as we're recording. And mm-hmm. uh, w- do you have any thoughts to that? Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, the, the the art that I saw is like, yeah, that's... I guess that's a that's a, a, a bunch of Legion characters, maybe. <laughs> um, that, I'm, not, I'm not trying to disparage uh, Mr. Rosmo at all because I'm, I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, but is, I, you know, the, just the image I saw was is like there's 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 a character shot you can recognize a few characters, uh, just based on their how they look or their construction or whatever. But um, it's it's fine, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> out of out of, out of uh, out of the characters in the DC universe that I think Mr. Rosmo really fits or could fit, the Legion is one of those. So I think this is a good a good pairing. Yeah, I mean, I'm a fan of, of Riley's artwork. I'm um, going back to, uh, you know, like Cowboy Ninja Viking, Proof, um, uh, he he did the most recent Martian Manhunter maxi series, which was really mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Um, Spe- speaking of a good pairing of artist and character or concept. Yeah, yeah, and and it, and he's different, right? He's he's one of those artists that's very expressive in his artwork, mm. mm-hmm. and I appreciate that, even if it may not always be the right fit here and there. Uh, I'm always a fan. Now. <laughs> To the larger question of, you know, what is it going to feel like if we read the book? If we read the book, you know, I did buy it. I, I did you buy that one at all or no? 
I did not buy any yeah. of, or pre-order any of the future state books. I, I plan on, if they'll be collected. Right. They'll be on the DC Universe app. Right. I will read them. I just decided not to get the individual issues as they were coming out. Yeah, I just recorded a, a DC All-Stars uh, episode that'll come out sometime around the same time as this episode, probably, or if it hasn't already. And we just did a very short, at the end, talk about Future State. I originally was going to buy everything. Uh, cause I did that with convergence, but, um, uh, I don't know, I guess I just backed off. Um, and I only picked a few here and there, Legion being one of them. And then had the fortune to have someone, uh, I read the first week's worth of future state books because someone loaned me their review copies and, um, I read four so far. And I am zero for four in my overall enjoyment of them. Ooh. Yeah. It, it made me go, hmm, <laughs> I'm actually really glad I did not pick all these up. Yeah. Now, to be fair, the Legion book is by Bendis. So even if it is outside of the normal run, it might still have a tone that might not be so jarring or, mm -hmm. or it might just be a little familiar with what, what we've been reading currently. So, you know, we'll see what happens with that, <laughs> with that book. <laughs> well, sp speaking of that, um, yeah, cause I'd forgotten that Bendis was writing it. Um, having read a bunch of Bendis books, not just the Legion title, but uh, I just uh, read the the first volume of Young Justice that he did. Um, if I, and I and I say this, but loving Bendis, I I I adore his work. Uh, but man, there is a sameness to his young. I'll just say younger character uh, um, interpretations that can can be a little grating at times if if he if he doesn't you know change things up a bit so i'm i'm very curious if we get that in this future state legion book as well so i now i'm now i'm looking forward to reading this one just to, just as a comparative uh, exercise <laughs> and then to see whatever comes on the flip side of future state with the legion yeah i'm very very curious what the well, not just the Legion, but the the the, the future state of the DC universe after uh -huh. this. <laughs> so thank you, Sergeant America, for you know yeah. giving us a little talking point there. Uh, Peter, I also have some feedback mm -hmm. regarding the celebratory video that you created uh, for the Legion Project podcast. Oh, cool! Uh, so this mostly on Twitter. Uh, just a few things here: uh, Charlton Hero, Chris said uh, great job guys legion the legion project podcast is one of my most anticipated podcasts today uh i think uh, chris is one of our super fans and uh, uh and you may know who this person is in real life peter this is dr pop culture bgsu mm -hmm. on twitter mm -hmm. uh simply said long live the legion project so awesome. uh, I, I appreciate the, the these these comments from those guys and their support this is awesome and on YouTube, actual comment on YouTube <laughs> when I posted the video uh, from Sleepy Reader, Damien, who has been on my show uh, several times, um, he just said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, I, I mostly encouraged uh, or I included this. Uh, this is from bbally81 on Twitter. Uh, but uh, uh, bbally brought up this this point that I wanted to uh, question for you, Peter. Uh, but B. Bally says, no matter how many big name writers DC brings in like Bendis, nothing will beat the Bronze Age run. Long live the Legion. Ooh. And and <laughs> to which I, I I posit, are we still in the Bronze Age? Given that Crisis is I it's still going on at the time of the publication of of, of this series, right? Yeah, we're we're a few months past it now. Okay, okay. So yeah, so we're still in the the formative post crisis uh, time right, right. where the DCU is not quite baked, <laughs> right? 
Although in my in my notes for this episode, um, for all the books that are you know shipping around the same time as Legion of Superheroes twenty seven, Man of Steel issues one and two dropped during this month of July nineteen eighty six. Uh-huh. So we, if you if you need like some kind of starting point, Man of Steel is 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 a pretty good one because from here on mm-hmm. out is when Superman solidifies. So. Um, yeah, I, I always tend to think, and it's really about collectors, right? Uh, that the bronze age ends with the crisis and yeah, yeah everything post crisis is, I mean, some argue that it's the modern age, even though it's been how many years since crisis crisis that we're still in the modern mm-hmm. age, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but whatever people want to call it, um, so, I mean, the Baxter run was spawned out of the Bronze Age. It kind of has it has a similar feel throughout all of the run, I think, I, you know, from what I remember. Um, so if this is where he's talking, if this is what he's talking about, then um, I guess technically he's not wrong. Um, is it the best? Um, probably... I think what I think what probably people recognize the most, and I feel this way with the new Teen Titans from the '80s as well. It's the last time those two franchises, when they were at their height, it's the last time they are in that kind of like recognizable form, right? Paul mm-hmm. Levitz yeah. on Legion, Keith Giffen here and there, although he comes back, Wolfman and Perez. The, the the Legion that you remember them in their costumes, you know, not the five years later Legion when they're not in costumes. You know what I mean? Like you can pick up the Baxter run, any of the issue and you go, yeah, right. There's lightning last, there's shrinking violet. Um, yeah. It, it, maybe even because there's two Legion books at this time, even though one is a, a reprint right now. Um, you know, the Titans certainly had, their volume plus they had teen Titans spotlight you know so i think i think in that instance you know if if we're looking at the height of the legion this is probably the height of the legion mm-hmm. uh, is it the best legion you know i guess that's that's then your opinion from there <laughs> <laughs> well you know it, it's funny because when i when when we first started started uh this this podcast and reading these issues and as i've said many times um there's a huge chunk of this volume of the Legion that I had not read. And we are, we are in the midst of that right now uh, with issue 27 and some others right before that. And uh, when we first got, started talking about doing this show and, and which version of the, or which volume of the Legion that we were going to focus on, um, you know, we had talked about focusing on the five year later run uh, because we both really like that 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 uh, that that volume of the Legion, and so when I think back on the Legion, um, it is it is the run of books bef- right before the uh, volume three, the Baxter run, that I have a, a, a huge. I, I adore that that run right leading up to that. And because there's, like I said, there's a huge chunk of, of, of volume three that I had not read, I don't feel as connected to, or, or excuse me, did not feel as connected to. <laughs> and then, and then the five year later, because that, you know, I, I dove right back into the Legion, um, right before the five year later run, uh, started. And so I think of those two eras as, you know, that's my, my Legion, um, and, but having now, as we have been, um, reading these books, uh, examining them as we have been, and and uh, based on what you have brought to this in terms of expanding the the scope of of interest, mm-hmm. uh, looking at the the various books that tie into the Legion and and just kind of the greater universe of 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 the 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 book and these characters at this time at that you know during the that that publication time um 
boy, I don't know. I I I, I am hard pressed now to to say this version of the Legion versus that version of the Legion, um, because there's every every version has this wonderful uniqueness and and uh, examination that is is wonderful to to go through. And uh, I, 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 I don't, I can't, I don't know that I could say anymore that the pre Baxter ver- version of the Legion is my my most uh, uh, dearest of the of of the different volumes or or the five year later. I, in fact, I, I might be premature in saying this because we're only twenty seven issues in of a what was it sixty three issues mm-hmm. total. Um, uh, I'm maybe liking this one more than the five year later. So, you know, I just, I, I guess, I guess it'll depend. <laughs> so anyway, this is, this has been a, a wonderful journey so far and I can't wait to, to continue this and figure out how these things compare and, and uh, you know, regardless of whether we are still in the bronze age or what, what the, what the best version of the Legion is. Eh, uh, I, I guess my, I have a more of a rolling scale than a than a definitive, you know, this one versus that one. <laughs> right, right. And there's always, I, I feel like your favorite Legion era or your favorite any comic book era is probably the one you're currently reading at the time, you know, like, or if you're really like investing in something like we are, you know, if I was doing the same, well, well, we are doing it. We, we're, we're jumping back and forth to older eras and I'm finding stuff in those older books that I'm like, oh, that's so cool, you know, in hindsight, right? So, uh, and that's actually a really good uh, way to segue into what we're doing for this episode because this is an issue that is kind of speaks to that larger Legion concept, um, uh, speaks to that whole, you know, look at the Legion as a whole. Uh, and we have a couple topics where we might do something to that nature. So shall we jump into Legion of Superheroes issue 27? <laughs> Let's do this. So this is uh, this issue is titled Going Home. This is by Paul Levitz, Greg LaRoque, Colleen Duran, Sean McManus, uh, Gene Colan, Mike DiCarlo, Arn Starr, <laughs> John Costanza, <laughs> Carl Gafford, and Karen Berger with a cover by Steve Lytle. So we had uh, we have uh, a few different uh, uh, vignettes, and that's why we have all these different artists, and we'll talk about those specific those the artist contributions specifically uh, as we get to those. Uh, so the uh, the synopsis, which Peter for me is quite short, uh, unusually so uh, compared to some other issues that I've done these for, um, uh, but that's not to, that's not to, to, that's not a comment on the uh, the quality of the work definitely. But uh, anyway, we begin the issue uh, on Arando, where the Council of Regents ask Projectra if she is ready to resume her role as queen. She tells them yes, but then abdicates and leaves for Earth. Element Lad and Jvon Aaron arrive on Trom to pray for the dead and have a, a, a wonderful little moment together. And on Xerox, the sorcerers free Mordru, oh no, from his earthen prison, and appear to restore his soul, reverting him to a childlike state. Afterwards, the sorcerers invite White Witch to join them as a teacher, but she turns them down to go back to the Legion. And on Earth, Colossal Boy and his wife Yura are visiting his parents. Jim expresses concern about the current uh, UP president and asks his mom to keep her ears open. Meanwhile, at Legion HQ, finishing off the book, most of the rest of the Legion relax together. Uh, Starboy and Dream Girl snuggle. Block and Timberwolf play a game, as do Polar Boy and Tellus. The Rances and Magnetic Kid discuss Sensor Girl and Children. Phantom Girl attempts to cure Sunboy of his mm, appreciation of the feminine form and fails. And we learn that the Legion has voted to accept Sensor Girl into the ranks once again. Yeah, kind of like a catch-all issue, right? That, that mm-hmm. we've, We're familiar with that. It's happened uh, one or two times so far in this run. Um, and as I said, I think at the top of the episode, I wanted to go all the way up to this issue because it kind of puts an end to the Sensor Girl stuff in one way or another. Um 
maybe not completely, but at least in terms of her role with the Legion and, um, uh, you know, it's a nice, nice, I mean, the, the cover even says beginnings, endings, and other mysteries. So, uh, felt like it was a good way to just wrap up what we've been talking about since issue 14. Um, generically speaking, uh, don't have a lot of notes for this issue. Like I, like you mentioned, and I thought it was a fine issue, um, in terms of, of, of an issue that is speaking to, or a, a sort of slower issue or a, uh, let's take a breath kind of issue. Um, I think it was what issue number nine that also did that as well. Because we also got that similar one-page um, shot of all the Legionnaires in that like rec room area, which LaRoque tries to imitate here. Um, so I, I, I sort of connected back to that issue as it was drawn by Lytle. Um, I walked away with this issue and went, okay, um, not quite the sense of girl wrap-up that I wanted, um, or, or maybe that I expected, which really is my own fault. Um, and some of the other stories I was like, okay, those were fine. Those were fine. Um, yeah, I kind of walked away and was like, okay, this is a fine issue under a really good cover. <laughs> yeah, I, you pretty well subbed up my feelings about this too. Uh, I'll, I'll just add that, uh, you know, it, it was nice to see some different artists, uh, on the book, um, which, you know, I don't know that we have an answer for this, but, you know, why did they decide to do it this way as opposed to having LaRoque do all the, the chapters? Um, uh, you know, was it a timing thing or, or you know, or just you know, by design, uh, perhaps? Um, uh, and, and I just, I also like, you know, just generally speaking, the theme, you know, because the, the title of, this, of, of the issue is Going Home, uh, even despite the, 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 the cover banner, which is, you know, it also sums up the book, uh, maybe a little too on the nose, but but I like I like the theme of going home that are, that's in all of the vignettes. So that that nice through line that uh, I think Levitz is 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 doing here, and he and he's good at that. I'm, I mean, some of the letter columns or some of the letters for this issue in a later um, issue kind of bring up the whole, you know, why did you use why did you use different artists and, and in the way that you did? So it's kind of confusing from chapter to chapter without any breaks, but I, I didn't mind that so much. Maybe it's cause I'm just used to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not get that, that complaint. I, I, I read that too. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what, what else do you need besides a visual indication that there's a different artist? Why, why does it, does it need to flow? No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that, uh, that particular viewpoint, but. Plus, I felt the artists that they chose really, they were good, good decisions. They were good choices. Um, Colleen Duran on the Element Lad. And maybe this is me in hindsight, right? Because she did a few issues in five years later, too, based on one of them with Element Lad. So it's it was kind mm. of, I didn't realize, I was like, oh, look, here, here she is, you know. Um, I think even on Twitter, she posted an element lad drawing just recently, you know? So it was kind of like, Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. This is obviously a character that speaks to her. So, and, and didn't she also work on the valor book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. There were a few issues that she did there. So it's nice to know, Oh, it was like, Oh, okay. I didn't realize she was part of this uh, run. Um, the Sean McManus artwork on on the White Witch more Drew stuff is, is I was like okay yeah that kind of makes sense you know it's it's not it's not quite the McManus stuff from like Omega Man or when he really goes kind of loose with his mm. artwork. Um, same thing with Gene Colan. I I didn't think he went too deep into what he could do um, for the for that chapter with Colossal Boy because it was just a quiet chapter right it was just people talking. Um, yeah, I, th I thought it was fine. I thought it was. Uh, I had no problems with the construction of the book, um, how it was laid out. The artwork's fine. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible because it makes it sound like it's average, and uh, but it, it was just fine. It was. <laughs> yeah. It was. It was a nice breather to. To we're going to be able to talk about this without going, you know, way in depth with things, right? Like, it was fine. <laughs> well, it yeah, it's you know there there's not. 
uh, you just mentioned this, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of characters talking. Um, and it's not, that's not a, that's not a ding on the issue. It's just that there's a lot of exposition that's going on here. And the, I think especially, uh, Gene Colan is is probably doing the better job here of of giving us a little bit of variety uh, between the panels, um, given that this is a bunch of talking heads. <laughs> so you know, I uh, yeah, I, I I I feel like it's uh it's not a it's certainly not a bad issue. Um, uh, it's it's just a lot of different things going on is all. The. Uh talking issues for for uncanny x-men around this time are some of my favorite issues so i think that's why i walked away and was like okay you know know, the high i think i built up this issue more than um the book did itself you know because i i wanted to see what the sensor girl stuff was and um so so we'll, we'll we'll get to all that i guess just to add uh this is the kind of story that and I, I feel like I say this almost every episode <laughs> about every issue, but it makes me want to read the next issue because they, they bring up certain aspects of the character or a certain plot point that uh, is going to continue. Um, I, 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 you know, it, it's a great way to get us to issue 28, theoretically. <laughs> and to, and to, con- uh, to get us past the censor girl stuff, right? Like yeah. we're, we're, we're in uncharted territory um, and one of the topics we're going to bring up today is going to speak to, you know, plots and subplots. So we're kind of like in an, even though it's not really, we haven't gone through 12 issues. We're not at like, we're in year three right now, um, of the Legion run. Um, it still feels like a nice starting point from here on, just like mm-hmm. issue 14 kind of did. So, yeah. in a way. Let's compare covers. Legion of Superheroes 27 by Steve Lytle from 1986. Tales of the Legion of Superheroes 352 from 1987, right, I believe. Um, Yeah, this one by Luke McDonald, artist on um, Suicide Squad uh, after the Legends series. Um, I think at this point he was, Luke McDonald was probably doing the last year or so of Justice League Detroit. And then he would move on from there to Suicide Squad. So um, two covers. What did you think? Which one do you prefer? Let's start no, there. This, nothing <laughs> against Mr. McDonald, but this, there is no comparison here right, right. Uh, for, for this. And, you know, this has nothing to do with the, the events that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, obviously the, the issue 27 cover by Lytle is is so wonderfully executed uh beautifully drawn the construction of it uh with um the white witch ghost hovering behind uh an emerging mordru and then that flows into uh the the specter i'll say of sensor girl with with projector in front of that and then you have the two other stories uh, the, the characters from the two other stories uh, uh, two of the other stories, I should say, um, on either side. It's just a, it's so beautifully done and balanced and uh, nuanced. I, 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 I love this cover. It's, it's great. <laughs> Remember that other cover where they're like, we want you to be in the Legion, you know, starting now, a new Legion era, right? It was, I forget that was like 17 or something like that uh, or 19. Um and, and it was a fine cover. It was a LaRoque cover. But I feel like this one is, even though it's not, it's sort of the same, but not quite. Um, this one just, it's good. It's a good cover. It's a really good cover. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and uh, I, I forgot to mention this, the the, the shading uh, of the sensor girl image. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> it looks like Lytle was was taking a cue from uh, a fellow Legion artist, Ernie, Col- Ernie Cologne, mm. uh, with, with the hatching. The cross hatching right, there, right? Which I mean, it's just it's it's with with the the lighter shade of of sensor girl's hair with that. I just I don't know. I from a 
just from a visual standpoint, the the colors and and the, how everything blends together is just so well done. Yeah, and I feel like Luke McDonald's his artwork on on the Tales cover. Um, I sort of feel it's like he's shorthanding what the Legionnaires look like, what their costumes look like. You know, just as long as you get the mask and the blonde hair and the S of Sensor Girl, or you get the star on Dream Girl's cheek, or you get the stripe in individual. As long as you get like certain elements, oh, they should be able to figure them out. Like, I, it it's taking me a while. I think that's Timberwolf with Block and Invisible Kid. Yeah, I I had to think about that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's what I mean. Like, you know, it's 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 okay. It's not great. It's not a great cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he he is trying to convey a, a similar mm, quality or theme mm-hmm. in in these images. It's just you know, you know, obviously constructed a very different way. Um, I, I I do like how you know the background of this cover is a galaxy, our galaxy, presumably, and and all of these images in the in in the circles on on the cover. These are worlds. Um, uh, that are uh, that are in this galaxy. So you know he's he's trying to do something with that. The whole uh, future quality of the Legion, and they're all from different worlds. And in fact, we we ha- we uh, are on different worlds in the story. So you know, he, he, it's not like he just threw a bunch of images on on the cover here, and and he and that's it. But um, yeah, that just I, you know you, you, you compare the two, and it. Like I said, it's 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 obvious which one is is the superior one, <laughs> more favored. Yeah, I, I should. You're right. I should that it, it's definitely a subjective call. Yeah, those are good points that you you made too. I, do you have? I don't know if you have the issue, but the issue that I have, the UPC symbol, is is not the you know the barcode. It's it's the Legion flag, and ah, the Legion flag has the same elements as the cover. It has all the worlds. It has like Saturn, some stars, a moon, you know what I mean? So it's almost Mm -hmm. like you could say he's just evoking the flag by the use of all these Ah. bubbles and such and and the, and the galaxy background. So it's actually a nice, maybe unconscious little bit of uh, connecting connection there. No, see my copy has the barcode. So Ah, I, I missed out on that detail. Always, I always try to get the the direct market version as opposed to the new stamp when I can because you know that's where you get like the new DC. There's no stopping us now. Or yeah, re- read Batman this month. You know, it's kind of fun. <laughs> I miss I miss that comics uh, don't do that. Uh, that I miss that comics don't do that right anymore on their covers. But I miss a lot of things about the the comics that I read in the the, the <laughs> mid to late eighties. <laughs> that's why we're doing an eighties podcast. <laughs> that's practically. Right. um okay so let's let's get into the story uh it's well all the individual stories we'll start with the sensor girl stuff because that's the biggest that's the one that's wrapping up everything from from what we've been talking about all these low these many episodes (laughs) um some of the things that I, i i took from uh that first story it was a little immediate i think in in how it wrapped up um and it obviously bookends to the to the last chapter of this book. I think the biggest thing with for me, um, I think it makes sense character wise where she's like, "All right, I want the throne back," and they're like, "Great, here you go." And then she's like, "Great, now do whatever you want with it." Like it, that feels very projector like. <laughs> it feels very post sensor girl projector to me. Like I I kind of went, okay given her sort of stern nature for all these, for this past year uh, and some issues, I was like, okay, that, okay. I, you know, even the whole, I see through the illusion of, of what it means to rule, blah, 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 blah. Even though it kind of went really fast, I was like, okay, I can accept that. The one bit of the story that I was like, oh, see, this is really, I want, this is the part that I wanted more from was when she said, look, I paid my debt. My penance is done. And I kind of thought, is it done? What did you do? How'd you how'd yeah. you pay that debt? I'm not quite sure Levitt's really tapped that that uh, theme there. What'd you think? Yeah, same thing. I, I had the same the same reaction. Um, 
uh, you know, in my notes, I, I, I put, if, if, if Projector wanted to atone to her people, why is she now leaving them? Why is she abandoning them after the, the uh, atrocities that she inflicted on them through her association with the Legion? And, and yeah, what, what, what is, what, what's different now? What, uh, what has she done? I, I don't understand. She defeated the Fatal Five or helped to, de- to defeat the Fatal Five. Right, they're not the Legion of Supervillains, the ones that yeah. you know, brought all this about. Um, <laughs> what? Well, yeah, so what are the, as she says, the honors won afresh? Or maybe one of the other, the Regents said that. I don't I don't remember, but yeah. it's like, what? Uh, yeah, it's it's, it's short shrift, and uh, you know, it seems like Le- Lev is just like, okay, well, let's just move on. <laughs> yeah, and I even feel like if, I feel like he could have kept all this stuff about her getting the throne back, Maybe, maybe he a better way to do it would have been to. Oh, I shouldn't play this game, but <laughs> instead of like taking the throne and then giving it back, they it's like it's like why even why is she even on Orando? Like we haven't been there, you know. Like so, if she goes back and they're like, hey, we've seen now that you you've been uh, your identity has been revealed. We called you back, you know, um, can we give, we'll give you the throne. Maybe she could have said, look, I'm thankful for you to give me the throne back. But now that I have these new powers and these new uh, feelings about what the world is, you keep it, do what you want. I'm, I'm going to stay on this journey because I think it's more important, not only for me, but for you. Like, yeah, because that's that's a theme that's been going on with Orando. It's like they want to keep in this feudal state. They they want to make their keep their world isolated. Sometimes we get the notion that Projectra being sent away was a way to bring her back so that she can kind of show them that the rest of the galaxy is not all that terrible. You know, you can mm-hmm. come to modern times. And then other times it's like they, they still want to be sort of secluded. So I feel like it could have been a different journey. She could have stayed with the Legion as Sensor Girl. Maybe the penance part is gone, but um, I don't know. Maybe maybe it was a way to bring Rando to something else, just like she has been brought to something else. So, yeah, yeah. That that's the part that I was like, oh, blah blah. I wanted. To. <laughs> yeah, I, I I totally agree that we have been so focused on who Sensor Girl uh, is. And then when we find out, that resolution is just so quick. It seems like there's awful lot of buildup, and then very little payoff. Uh, you know that's maybe unfair because I don't know what comes next with this character. Right. Um, but if it is simply that she is just another member of the Legion of Superheroes, I will feel uh, maybe a little uh, taken advantage of. <laughs> As a reader. <laughs> well, plus Orando is still in that limbo world. You know? Right. I don't think we ever get a resolution to that. You know? I, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Because I, I, I don't know. And it it's such an interesting, a potentially interesting plot point that here's this world out there. And she's abandoned them as her, as their leader. You know, you know, ten years from now, do do does Orando decide? You know what? We're gonna we're gonna take back the the our former u- uh, home of our universe. That didn't that didn't sound right. Our 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 take our place. Let's just put it that way. We're gonna take our place in in the uh, in the larger universe and be a force uh, to be reckoned. You know, now I'm now I'm writing the story for for Levitz and company. But you know, just just there's just these possibilities here that. I don't know why 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 abandon this why why not explore that some more I it's just it's just it's an odd decision I think boy if they really wanted to be secluded from the rest of the galaxy that being in a limbo is is an answer for that I suppose yeah so, yeah <laughs> well one of the things Eric and I did uh, for this episode um, was I, I offered up the notion to go back and read some Projectra Karate Kid stuff uh, from the pre-Baxter issues uh, as a way to maybe see if there was anything um, that might connect to 
the whole sensor girl stuff. Um, so we're talking, uh, you know, issues. Uh, let's see. Well, we're really like I, I wanted to go back and read Legion of Superheroes Annual Number Two, which was the wedding for Karate Kid and Princess Projectra, because I, I think I've read. It. Yeah, I have read it before, but I just wanted to put that in. But we're talking about like you know there was. Uh, a page or two in issue 284, 285, a backup tale in 286, a full issue in 288, and then some random stuff in 296, 299, 301, 303, and then another backup tale in 309. So those were the issues that we uh, didn't read all of those issues, just little pages here and there. So... um and Eric, you have to correct me on some of this because I'm not quite sure of the timeline. But I think it takes place, or it's meant to take place, after the Karate Kid series. But that had ended a couple years before, though, right? Yeah, and th- he actually makes reference to that in one of those one of those issues um, uh, because uh, you know he uh, the, the the king the the former king of Orando had basically wanted him to prove himself, you know, a, a commoner wanting to marry or to be with his daughter, right? And so, that, as I recall, that was that was kind of the premise of him going back to the 20th century in that series to prove himself. Kind of like the, now, yeah, kind of like the journey that Projector is sort of on, mm. or was, anyway, mm. <laughs> to prove herself to, or, you know, for him to prove himself to, to, uh, the king but you know by extension orando itself so right. yeah yeah so that yeah definitely this is this is following that series yeah and I, I mean there's not much that i took away by doing that um i think the larger one of the larger points that i took away from rereading all this stuff um was and again this is all kind of like hindsight right it's it's not that it's uh um unless unless it was Levitt's really dropping these seeds all the way back to what 1982 I think um in issue 285 uh the king king Voxva uh he responds to Karate Kid's quest and says look of your courage and might I have no doubt yet there are omens and auguries attendant upon letting a commoner marry a princess and I went ooh you know did he foresee you know it's almost like a head kind of thing you could almost say he foresaw that that something bad was going to come out of their marriage right Ooh. and whether that was just paul levitt's writing some purple prose back then well it kind of proved the king right because they you know not only with not only between karate kid and projectora the death of karate kid but even with what's happened with orando you know, like um, you could almost say that he, by marrying a commoner, she brought all this onto the planet, which is unfair. Mm-hmm. But that's a point she did bring up before, though. So, um, so that was something, and it and it echoed a little bit in the annual too, where um, I think it was the annual or or another issue where Karate Kid was like, look, you know. Nothing bad's going to happen, and then he crosses his fingers, right? <laughs> it's like, oop. <laughs> I don't know if that was, you know, maybe nothing bad was going to happen at the wedding but or something. So so I, I think that was one thing that I kind of, when I went back, I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. You could trace all this back to that one bit of dialogue. Was there anything you found by going back? Well, there was one thing uh, that I, f- I found interesting, uh, but first I think I, I need to preface this with a question for you, because I don't remember, because it just occurred to me and I didn't, so I didn't have time to look this up. What happened to Projectra's, um, I don't remember her relationship with Ferox? That's her cousin? Cousin? Yeah, that's what I thought. Do we do? Do you remember what happened with him after his appearance in issue three hundred nine? No, I think I think that was it. Right, it, it barely was mentioned um, after that. So I think. he, so he didn't, he, he didn't, he wasn't dispatched by the uh, Legion of Supervillains when they took over Orando. He's not in the first five issues. Okay, so 
that's what I remembered as well. And and so uh, <laughs> that, that that backup tail in three oh nine, there's there's a you know a Ferox tries basically tries to kill Projector and Karate Kid, and then take over Orando, right? Uh, obviously he's defeated, but if this brings up a, a possibility of, you know, given the current situation with Orando, if Ferox is still alive, here's an, a prime opportunity for him to take over. Hmm. And, you know, the story writes itself. Right. <laughs> but, and, and so part of the reason I bring this up is because um, at the end of that backup story, and I uh, completely forgot about this because uh, I had not read that issue in a very long time until you, you listed it here. Um, at the end of the issue, or, or yeah, at the end of that story, uh, you know, Karate Kid is is basically defeated Ferox, but then he Ferox is taken away by, or he gets mm, swallowed up by a portal that looks sort of like um, I forget the character's name uh, in the Legion of Super Villains story, Peter Zamir. Yeah, Zamir. Uh, and so you know, this is. What what did we what did we say before we we uh, started recording? That's how how many oh, issues away? Four or five months from the first. Yeah, Baxter four or five issue? months yeah. away. Yeah. So yeah, the this this is uh, this has to be a a hint to uh, of what's to come for that that uh, that first story in in the Baxter run. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was really cool to see that. And there were now that I think about it, there were two other scenes during those build up issues. Uh, one with Sen- Sun Emperor coming to like a quaint little town village. They don't call it a rando though, um, and he like blows up a village, and then oh, there's that's right. And then there's another scene where a survivor of that attack goes to a castle. Um, but when I when I looked through it, I was like, no, they don't mention a rando. So it was like all this subtle subplot thing going on for Levitz, um, which then builds to that backup issue. And then eventually builds to the Baxter run itself. And part of, like, the other thing that I got from reading all these issues, um, and we should mention that issue uh, 284, although Levitz had wrote the book before, even earlier, than, like, you know, not too, not too distant from 284, that was the first issue where he becomes, like, permanent writer. Mm-hmm. And, and he's already dropping, you know, not only the whole Karate Kid and Projector are off the table but there's even a hint of um karate kid saying look you know we're not married we're not married not yet anyway or something like that um it seems like even back then he was he was going to he wanted to do something with these characters if if it's not necessarily like a direct lineage all the way from 284 to sense girl you know obviously not sense girl but to the death of karate kid the one thing I did, the other thing I took away from those, um, reading through those issues is just like in the Baxter run where he's really paying attention to the female creator uh, characters and trying to advance them and give them different powers and trying to make them, uh, make, make them not be so silver agey. Uh, I also started to take notice that it felt like Levitz came into the book and he said, okay, I want to do something with couples it's not enough for them just to be couples. They need to, we need to do something. He certainly did it with lightning lad and Saturn girl by giving them a baby, which was hinted, hinted at the first time in that Legion annual number two. Um, and then eventually taking them off of, you know, Legion membership. Um, he did it with lightning light lass and timber wolf throughout this run through the great darkness saga and, and before it and after it breaking them up taking light light last off the table completely. Um, and I noticed it with, uh, you know, with Karate Kid and Projector. It's not just that they're a couple. What do you do with them now that they are a couple? And what kind of story can come out of that? So I don't know if it's so deliberate, but that's that's kind of a feeling I got for some of those couples throughout, throughout the way. Um, because Karate Kid and Projector being a couple... Okay, they're a couple. What do you get out of that other than some pages where they smooch, right? Like Phantom Girl and Ultra Boy or Monel and Shadow Lass, all they do is smooch. 
Um, well, what do you do? What can you do out of that coupling? And, and I thought, mm-hmm. oh, that's kind of interesting, you know, a commoner. Uh, he has to give up his status. Um, they go and get married. They have an annual devoted to it. Uh, and then eventually along the way, Levitz is like, great, I'm going to use Orando as a ba- backdrop to the villain war. Like that, okay, there's something calculated there, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. It makes me wonder, too, given this, what you're, what you're, what you're extrapolating here, um, then why... Why allow Karate Kid to be killed? Why why build up this relationship for for you know a few years now in publication time, and then not explore what happens after they they get married and he becomes uh, you know consort to the queen you know all that all that kind of political uh, medievalist medievalistic uh, intrigue. Uh, on Orando, so I, I just maybe he. I, I'm curious if if Levitt's thought. Well, I guess I don't really have anything else to tell about this couple, so I'm just going to allow the allow Karate Kid to be killed off. Because as we talked about, uh, Giffen is the one who really wanted to get rid of that character. So, uh, and Paul's like, okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like you just they write him out. They write both of them out, but. If you don't, I guess if he says, well, we got to kill off Karate Kid. Okay, but that means something then. You got to do something with Projector. What do we do with yeah. her? Okay, yeah. well, let's well, wrap wrap it up in the villain war. And then eventually, uh, as we talked about, she gets she gets to be Sensor Girl, even though that wasn't the original plan. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, and so, you know, whatever, whatever the machinations behind the scenes were... Um, and uh, potential failings uh, on the part of the writer, uh, you know, he's he's taking what he has wrought and come up is, has come up with something else to do that makes a, a whole lot of sense. I mean, it's it, it kind of seems organic in the way that it was that it's come across, even though we know that you know the Sensor Girl was not going to be Projector originally. So. Yeah, I, I, again, it's it. Uh, I will compliment him on, on his ability to, to to weave a tale. Yeah, and like I said, some of this is just hindsight, right? We're just making these, yeah. <clears throat> which yeah. is what we do here at the Legion Project, <laughs> uh, and I think we do well. Um, I think I read somewhere either it was a letter column reaction or it was Paul Levitt saying it himself in one of those early letter columns where he says, "Look, I I want to come into the book and I want the." I want the team to be in disarray. And that's why they get the buildup to the Great Darkness Saga. So you can see them rallying together, right? Um, and it makes for more interesting stories. If they're all on the same adventure, like they were for a lot of the Silver Age stuff leading up to Paul Levitz, um, and you don't have any of these subplots going on, then it's one big tale of the whole Legion fighting, you know, a jaywalker. And that's not fun. So... Um, so I could see it, you know, I, it was interesting to see, it was interesting to read the Legion, not issue after issue, but scene, little scene after little scene, and then to read a full issue and then a backup tale, you know, cause then you're mm-hmm. focusing on one element of what he's trying to do. And I actually kind of dug that, um, for, for the, for at least for this, for this pairing, because they're, they don't get much spotlight, right? Um, they're not the most important characters, and maybe that's why you do what you do with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about any backup Legion backup tale is is spotlighting those lesser, not lesser known, but lesser um, used <laughs> characters, mm-hmm. uh, and and seeing what 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 little tidbits that the 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 artist and 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 the writer can extrapolate for us the readers uh and and move those characters along a little bit and and you know we've said this several times now but Levitz is a master at that he he is he has i think done a very good job at taking you know 25ish uh, disparate characters and making something out of most of them if if not all of them to some degree so uh, yeah, it's this, that's uh, again been one of the joys of reading this book is is seeing the construction 
seeing the uh, the the way that that uh, the creative team is developing these characters and this universe and the story. By the way, in issue two eighty eight, which is uh, one of the f- issues that um, you could read the whole thing, and it has a lot of Karate Kid projector stuff in it. Karate Kid has dialogue when he's going after Farox, and he says, you guys go ahead, I've got a score to settle, which is almost verbatim to what he said when he went after Nemesis Kid in issue number four. Yeah. When I read that, I was like, wait, what? (laughs) Um, So I thought that was interesting. One of the other things, too, that I thought all this, reading all this, and then reading, reading Sensor Girl, and reading Projectra right before she becomes Sensor Girl, wow, what a difference. I mean, she's oh yeah, she's just tossing those illusions around, but they're not doing anything, you know? And she gets trampled, and, and she gets slapped a lot, and, and it's it's kind of... It's it's not what I would think a, a, a member of royalty would be like, you know? Like, I, I feel like the Sensor Girl persona is so what Projectra is and should be. Um, and maybe that's what she was in her some of her earliest appearances, you know. Maybe she was a little colder, a little sterner. But when she's with Karate Kid, wow, she just becomes like his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And I'm really glad Levitz decided to do something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's almost like a completely different character. But that's kind of his modus operandi, right? Because with Ayla, it's sort of the same thing. When she's light last, she's, you know, fully uh, Timberwolf's girlfriend. And then when she's transformed into Lightning Lass again, she it's almost like a different personality. But but not, you know, not completely so that there is a there is a, a through line with the with the characterization, at least in terms of when Levitz was writing the characters from right. when he started. So it's not it's not so jarring, but it but it's definitely a. Definitely a pattern, um, at least so far. Yeah. Vi Vi too, obviously. Right. You know, completely completely different character, but but there's a lot of motivation there, based on what happened to her. You know, she's dealing with a trauma, and this is this is her reaction to that. Well, we'll see. We'll see what comes out after issue twenty seven. Like, is he going to continue that trend with the female characters, mm. or does he maybe? go and try to do the same thing with one of the male characters uh, yeah, that might need yeah. it. it so. that would be that would be uh, that would be nice to see some, some well just just different characterizations i don't care whether it's the female character or the or the male characters or or the alien characters <laughs> just, <laughs> just exploration us, yeah just exploration exactly i mean what yeah. what 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 is it with tell us uh i i actually i know this this I'm way off off base here but um <laughs> I actually would like a lot, a lot more about Telus as opposed to Quizlet <laughs> going forward. So yeah, um, yeah. So like, a, we'll, we may do that again if if that ever comes up. Like uh, I think we talked about it before. It's kind of fun to go backwards and read the first appearance of a villain or a character or a relationship and just see what it helps us talk about. You know, for the current um, situation. So I was glad we did that. Um. Let's continue on. Let's uh, continue on with the Element Lad storyline. Sounds like you had some things to say about that. Well, again, I, we already we talked about the Colleen Duran art a little bit, um, uh, which I, I just I, I adore this. I, I love her interpretation of of Jan uh, in this story, and I could totally I could totally see her doing a Legion book, you know, taking over for Laroque. Perhaps uh, I think she would be a good successor. Um, Beyond that, uh, as we were just talking about, you know, the the, the uh, some of the female characters being uh, redrawn, so to speak, because of something that's happened in their lives. Uh, this is a, a somewhat similar thing in my mind, and I'm really curious how you w- will react to this, Peter. Element Lad in this story almost seems like a different person. Oh yeah, than, I agree with that. Than what we've seen before, and what we see at the end of the issue, uh, it's almost as if if he's drawn by a different <laughs> artist, that he has a completely different personality. But um, I'm I'm making light of it uh, because this is such a mm, profound is maybe too strong of a word, 
But the spirituality here uh, that that uh, Element Lad possesses, based on the genocide of his people, I there's something about that I, I just really connected with. And, uh, you know, it shows a different side to him that, you know, we, we've seen him dealing with the 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 death of his people before uh but it's usually couched in some sort of revenge against um uh oh boy i've forgotten the character's name roxas the butcher roxas yes uh so this is this is uh, as i recall this is a little new this but but being despite being new at least to me uh it totally makes sense I, I love the idea that 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 Element Lad is the person. So so they they go to Trom, and uh, Javon makes comments about these uh, uh, the, the graves. Um, he calls the the markers the uh, Sarens. Yeah, I think so. And then they go to uh, presumably this church. Well, she she explicitly says this is your church. Um, and you know, just just the idea that that uh, Element Lad, after the death of his people, created these markers where those people died, because and we, and we see this all over the place in 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 the panels. These 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 markers, these sarins, and they're everywhere, everywhere. And and just thinking about how a young man who survived the death of his planet the people on his planet, then having the wherewithal, the, uh, just the, what's the word I'm looking for, Peter? Uh, courage. Determination. Yeah, courage, courage, thank yeah. you. Yes, perfect. The courage to deal with that in the way that he did. I just, just that little detail says so much about element lad more than anything i think that we have ever seen about this character before and it was just so beautiful yeah i agree when i when i read this i thought wait a minute huh i i I know that this this spirituality that he has is a thing for element lad i know it's in the five years later in fact i think you know when you talk about personas his persona in five years later is almost very quiet, very, you know, uh, monk-like. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Even when he's with the larger team. Um, so when I saw this, I was like, oh, right. Oh, I was like, oh, okay. It made me think, is any of this kind of, um, side to element lad, is it shown even before this? Is it shown in the silver age? Is it shown in the early bronze age? I don't know. I don't remember. And I don't know. Um, but it was nice. It was a nice uh, way to reflect on his relationship with with um, Siobhan Aaron. Um, it's a it's a nice little touch into the culture of the third larger thirtieth century, all the different cultures. Um, and and uh, is it an, a little bit of an advancement of this couple? Right, like we're talking about couples. Um, oh, yeah. We've seen him flirt. We've seen him kiss. We've seen him do more than that. We've seen Schwan Aaron grab Element Lad's butt. Um, you know, and now we, and now we have this. You know, and and it was kind of interesting for her to say, "Are you asking me to marry you?" He's like, "No, that's your job." First of all, secondly, no, just just pray. You know, so, and it's really interesting considering what's been going on in the letter columns where people are talking about showing oh, religion yeah. in the 30th century, and <laughs> and here they actually are. You know. Um, and they do it. They do it in small ways. They do it with Invisible Kid in small ways and um, Colossal Boy. So um, I, I think that, like I said, the biggest thing I just took away was, oh, it's kind of nice to see this part of Element Lad this early because I didn't realize it showed up in the Baxter run. Uh, yeah. Whether it means something after this issue or not. Well, you, you had brought up the, the five year later. Um, I could totally see a connection between this this version of Element Lad and that one. And I'd forgotten about that aspect of him, because because uh, in the five year later run, he is returned to Trom, right? They 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 go to Trom to recruit him, right? That, as I he's recall, he's doing the same thing. He talks about, yeah, him, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And but it, but it's it, but it's it, the, the tone is completely different because as I remember, it's a very somber uh, element lad, a very somber situation, and this is presented as more of a celebration of life, uh, despite what happened to his people. I did. I don't think I realized until I started talking about this with you. This is probably my favorite. Uh, 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 vignette uh, in in this collection. So, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. And and uh, just just to add, uh, at the very last panel, um, uh, he says to Shvan, "That's part of how we pray because he he had changed some things about uh, the, her her radiation suit. It started to glow, and it, it's it's him doing it. And he says that's part of how we pray, Shvan." We dream a bit more beauty in the world, even if there is no one else left to see it. And I thought, well, that's uh, that. Uh, I'm extrapolating, but that seems like a comment on on artists, just generally speaking. <laughs> just you know, trying to create some beauty in the world, even if no one ultimately sees it, or not a lot of people see it. Right. I thought that was a nice little touch. Right. Yeah. Then we go to White Witch returning to her Sorcerer's World, Xerox, um, because all of her teachers feel that Mordru should no longer be imprisoned and they should release him and um, unified against him, kind of readjust his personality. Yeah, is that what you? Is that how you took it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they even say uh child in the body of a man. Mm. And the way that he's presented is it's like he is uh, uh 4 years old, 5 years old again. Yeah. It, kind of his response. What do you think Levitz's plan is here uh outside oh, of just setting him up maybe for a future story, but uh, like why? You know, why why go this is this is this a 30th century thing of like you should you should try to uh what's the word when you want to um oh rehabilitate yes rehabilitate your villains although, and although that's i mean this is not rehabilitation <laughs> this is this is neutering uh whole cloth <laughs> yeah 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 exactly uh boy you know cuz this starts off with this, this this seems like a representation of a, of a more enlightened culture. You know, we 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 no longer believe that solitary confinement because that's exactly. I mean, it's even more than solitary confinement because he's 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 completely cut off and immobilized uh, in in this earthen chamber that they have him in. But they come to the realiza- realization: this is not right. He is one of us. And he should not be uh, relegated to this existence, this basically non-existence, really. And they release him and then strip him of his powers. But then they do this other thing, this, to me, <laughs> to, I think to our collective uh, uh, viewpoint, this is a really awful thing, as you said, to neuter, neuter him in that way. And it's not just that they took away his power or at least the, presumably took away his power. Um, but then, like I said, they, they revert him to this childlike state to, uh, presumably start over. And this is the, while this is kind of a, a sci-fi concept that, that, that I keep seeing in literature and, and television and film, uh, you know, over the years that I, that I've consumed this stuff, um, it's still d- jarring to me to see that happen to a character because, you know, what what makes what makes us us? It's our, the, our our collected experience and the way that we interact with the world. And if that is all taken away, what are we? Hmm. That's a good point. So I I I don't know. Is this is I out of, out of all the stories, this is the one that bothered me the most <laughs> because of what they do to the villain. And yeah, he's a villain, sure, and he's tried to take over the world, and he's probably killed a lot of people. Uh but boy, that. <laughs> I have a problem with this one. And it's hard to guess what's going to come out of it, other than the obvious that he gets his memories back. And oh, yeah. I mean, this, and... 
that was my question. Yeah, uh, when when does this occur? Right. When? Yeah. How long after this does Mordru re- revert back to his his true self? You know, not true self. His 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 usual self. Yeah, and it's Mordru. I mean, the minute they release him, he's like, "Ah, I'm gonna kill you all." It's like, whoa, <laughs> this is the guy you you really think he should breathe air again? Really? Okay. Yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. Well, see that, but that's what that's why I like when I first started reading. I'm like, oh. These 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 folks, they're, they're like I said, they're more enlightened. They're they're doing the right thing, and then they turn around and do this other awful thing. Are they more enlightened though? Really? I mean, they're yeah. One I, of them's yeah. a cloud. One of them's vapor. One of them's a plant. <laughs> you think they should be, but are they? I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely a, a really interesting. I mean, we, we, the the sorcerer's planet Xerox has just kind of been one of those many background f- places filled with some essentially background characters. Uh, and and we don't really get a whole lot with them, mm-hmm. generally speaking. And so, just like with the the main characters of the Legion book, Levitz is is trying to, I think, trying to uh, uh, imbue these these background characters with a little bit more to them. And while I may not always <laughs> like it or agree with it, uh, at least he's doing something with them. <laughs> well, I guess the same could be said about the next chapter. We already talked a little bit about Sean McManus on art, unless you have anything else um, for that chapter. Um, Gene Colan on Colossal Boy and Yira, a character we haven't seen in a while, including Colossal Boy's parents, the former president, Marty Allen. Um, Basically just talking, I I sort of got out of this, you know, Marty Allen is feeling uh, a little left out politically now that she's no longer president. Um, and as you mentioned in the wrap up or in the synopsis, you know, that, uh, Colossal Boy has a feeling about the new president, uh, and he's half right in that regard. So definitely, definitely something will be happening, but not with the president. Um, uh, and then there was a, a an odd exchange about Sensor Girl dealing with Yira, where she says, hmm, I wonder what she sees in me when she looks at me. And then Colossal Boy's mom says, perhaps then we'll find out what you really are, you're a dear, I suppose. And I thought, I was like, huh, what? Yeah. What was that comment? And it, yeah, that was a strange comment. <laughs> the, and, and that was the comment, that, that was a thing in this little vignette that I just glommed onto. It's like, whoa, there's some, there's some friction here between mother-in-law and and uh and wife and and it and it's completely ignored <laughs> essentially i mean from a story uh standpoint it's not but from the characters you know jim is he seems completely clueless uh he, he just he's focused on this uh the president decide thing which is cool i mean it's not necessarily supported in the book i wish levitz would have given us a few more scenes Mm-hmm. You know, with the build up with Desai, whether it was just saying, you know, not allowing them to go to a certain planet or whatever, you know, like we really haven't gotten anything like that, which is unfortunate. So I hope we get to see some of that. It'll be a nice build up for the Universo project. Mm. But. Well, you know, and just a few pages later, uh, you know, Colossal Boy yanks his wife who's carrying a plate full of drinks or whatever uh and and everything's about to spill and she she transforms into this bird of some sort and somehow using her beak and claws is able to put everything back in the glasses (laughs) but uh, anyway that was a weird weird construction but mom and and daughter-in-law seem to come to some sort of resolution to maybe a problem i it's just it's just so weirdly constructed this one and where where i i really appreciate what like i said earlier what what the artist is doing in this in this vignette uh the the story itself this is probably the my least favorite but the weakest one out of the bunch which then leads us to the end of the book where the legionnaires are having a party voting again to put sensor girl into the legion of superheroes as a member um there were some things here and there uh saturn girl saying that she feels sensor girl should keep her identity a secret from the public 
which will give her a one-up because of her powers. Um, but I also thought that was an interesting... That's an interesting choice. It'd be interesting to see if Levitz actually does play with that. Mm-hmm. Um, because then how does that relate to, like, not only just the public, but certain Legion of Superhero characters that are maybe not on the team, but they're reservists or the account? Like, how far does this go? Who who actually knows? Will the villains know? Um it's almost like they have like a, an ace up their sleeve in a way. So we get a makeup between dream girl and star boy. Although I don't really know why they were fighting in the first place <laughs> other than cause it goes, it actually goes back to those issues that we read. Um, there's a, in the annual number two star boy, even all the way back then is like, Hey, I know you're a leader now, but why don't you ever ask me for help? And she's like, uh, because I'm busy. Number one, number two, <laughs> Number two, Dream Girl's reliable. She doesn't need your help, Starboy. You know? Yeah. And uh, I think that's probably why Levitz did that Starboy solo issue in, like, number 306 or whenever it was. Um, but he's a character that could definitely... He deserves a revamp of some sorts. Uh, I think we mm. do get a storyline with him. Um but it, yeah, it's it's like, oh, look, they're all made up. Okay, well, that was all going on in the background and probably not high on Levitz's list. Well, it's interesting. We were talking earlier about how uh, many of the female characters were simply uh, girlfriends to the male characters, right? And here we have the kind of the reverse, I think, at least in the Levitz era, where Starboy is really just kind of the boyfriend <laughs> of this really interesting, complex uh, uh, female character. And then on, on top of that, then this is the thing out of this entire sequence with all these Legionnaires, this is the thing that kind of like the, the thing with, uh, uh, Colossal Boy's mom, her comment that, that little exchange between dream girl and star boy, you know, he says, uh, you'd think after all these years, they declare a truce referring to, uh, sun boy and phantom girl. Although I don't understand where the all these years thing comes from, because this is new to me, <laughs> this this exchange between those two characters. But uh, Dream Girl says never, Tom, and then we get a, a, a this close up of her face. We can't even see all of her face. Uh, some of us never want to change, never. And I thought, well, for, well, first thing I thought was, what, what is this? What what and how does this relate to the earlier scene uh, or the scene in in one of the earlier issues where she's apparently stepping out on Tom? And so I you know this to me that's those things are connected. And then so what comes next? What what's what's going on with Dream Girl here? Hmm. Yeah, we might have to put a pin on that. Hmm. <laughs> but it is cool to see her in a Dream Girl costume, but with Starboy elements. Oh yeah, I had yeah, that's right. Isn't that cool? I I guess I hadn't really noticed that until I mean I I obviously saw it, but it's like I thought maybe it was just a uh, a coloring choice on the artist part. No, that's that's really cool. She she is so oh I she's becoming one of my one of more one of the more intriguing characters for me because she's she's so strong, intelligent, uh, um. She has these leadership qualities, and yet she will then also do, you know, she, I mean, she's wearing Starboy's costume. Uh, I, I would I would extrapolate to make up for their whatever their fight or something. I don't know. She's she's trying to appeal to him. She's almost like a a reflection. So she she adapts to the situation depending on what it is, and acts appropriately for that situation does that make sense oh yeah i mean she's she's smart she she knows how to play the game and play play who's around her and oh and, ma- yeah you know. I, manipulator she's a manipulator and i don't necessarily mean that in a bad way right. it's just that's her personality she yeah she's definitely one of the more interesting characters here i almost feel like in some ways she's like the successor personality wise to how they used to write Saturn girl kind of in those Ooh, early yeah. silver age days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, this, this the whole the last few pages. It's really just a way to get Sensor Girl back onto the team. It, it's not as in depth as as I wanted it, and it's kind of one of the reasons why I walked away with this issue and just said, okay, this is fine. I mean, we get little character things, but even the character things don't have a lot of weight to them, other than just Levitt saying, okay, here's this status quo. Here's this status quo. Um, uh, you know, here's the, oh, look, we, we got a Chase Ear mention of Dr. Chase Ear from issue 16, you know, uh, a character I didn't think we would ever hear from again. The, the, the science scientist, um, colleague of Brainiac five. Um, you mentioned Phantom Girl and Sun Boy. Um, we get a nod that Brainiac 5, Ultra Boy, and Chameleon Boy are, are off in Booster Gold at this time, which is good, smart. Um, maybe maybe one little thing here when Element Lad is like, look, we've all accepted her, and we've even accepted the death of Nemesis Kid as self-defense. Sort of, he says. <laughs> You know, it's almost like Levitt's going, look, I have no more room for this. You just just got to accept that this is this is the way it is. We'll deal with it later, maybe. But I, I got to move on to other things. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just... Wait, wait. So, wait, so let's go back to that. Yeah. Because uh, mm-hmm. now I'm thinking about it in terms of, you know, uh, grammatic... Uh, construction here. Jackie knows we've accepted the death of Nemesis Kid as self-defense. Sort of is the sort of a comment on how they've accepted it, or or that projector perhaps doesn't quite understand whether they've accepted it. E- either way, it doesn't it doesn't matter really. But either way, it 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 uh, presents some interesting uh, possibilities uh, between these characters going forward. Yeah, or that the self defense that it was self defense sort of because. I mean, mm, they, yes, they, yes. Yeah, I mean, they. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's why. I've, that's why again, I felt like it's just Levitt's making sure he touches on it, because Dream Girl yeah. touched on it last issue too, and instead of making a big, you know, in early Bronze Age or maybe some Silver Age stories, we would have gotten a whole chapter out of some trial and whatever, and then some robot would have crashed in and you know whatever. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just the way it's endings, beginnings. You know, this is an ending. Mm-hmm. What other, I, I really don't have much else. I feel like at this point, I'm just trying to find something to talk about with the wrap up. <laughs> Do you have any any other little points I, here and there? No, I just uh, again, I, I think I've said this before. Uh, I'm this this getting to the end of this and having Sensor Girl here. Uh, you know what what's next. And and this being a, a bookend, so to speak, um, it's I'm it's like it's like entering a new era of of the Legion at this point, and so I'm I'm really looking forward to what comes next. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's it was an issue like we talked about, and, and we'll see where we go from here. One of the things that uh, a suggestion from Eric um, that I thought might be interesting to do at this point, since this is kind of like a new starting point is uh, Eric suggested, uh, let's go back. Um, this was a random comment, an off comment you made in one of the er- other episodes about... Which, which I totally forgot about. Yeah, <laughs> see? Uh, I, I always write notes for our episodes after them, so just in case there's like things to bring up later. Um, he wanted to go back and see, you know, what were all these subplots? Did they f- get finished? Are there any... Is there anything else that's like still unresolved? Um, you, you wanted to compare and contrast basically the, the, the subplots that he's been spitting out here for the past 27 issues. And, uh, I think it's safe to say some of them are, are fairly obvious, you know, the, the mystery of sensor girl we've been talking about forever, you know, um, but there's some smaller things here and there, um, that have cropped up that, um, we should probably make mention um, or however you want to go about this segment. Uh, I don't think we need to cover everything, but. Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Cause there, there, uh, I, I, I haven't, I haven't done the math, but just kind of scrolling through all of the items that we've identified. We're talking about roughly three to four subplots being mentioned per issue. 
and and not all issues have a subplot that at least as far as I could tell but um and some had more than that but then some only had you know a few so but I'm I'm going to I'm going to say roughly 3 to 4 per issue so that's that's a lot in 20 26 issues <laughs> and that's the style that he likes to write in right he talks about ensemble mm-hmm. books ensemble tv shows movies etc uh so it sort of makes sense so um you did a lot of the work um what what were some of maybe your biggest takeaways what what subplots uh, do you want resolve? Which ones do you think resolved well? Or I don't know. How how do you want to go about it? Well, so uh, there's a couple of different categories, I guess, for this. One is uh, that I, it was interesting to see um, that some of these subplots were resolved very quickly uh, within an issue or two in some cases. And then others, you know, like Censor Girl, <laughs> took took many more. <laughs> and of course, then we have uh, uh, some things that I feel are still unresolved, and maybe there's some things here that I, I'm not really sure if there's subplots or not. Um, but you know, for example, we talked about Orando being in the limbo dimension. Um, will that ever come back? Kind of a thing, or is that is that just kind of a a random uh, aspect to the story? And that, that I don't know how you felt about. Uh, about uh, compiling this list, Peter, or or, or catalog- cataloging these things, but sometimes I had I had uh, uh, difficulty um, determining whether something was a was a subplot or not, or if it was just uh, a one off thing. Um, and then you you added some things in here that uh, I totally missed, um, which I now want to add to my uh, my. Um, my list of things that are unresolved. I had unresolved major plots and unresolved minor plots. And so um, do do we want to talk about those or or do you have other uh, observations about the the, the subplots in general? No, I think, I think that works well. I think you're right. Like there are subplots there, there are unanswered questions, but I also think a lot of these plots or subplots are also just Paul Levitz's way of, showing what the 30th century is like so they don't mm-hmm. need to be resolved right yeah like i think i think even if we want them to be that's not the focus it's just to give setting and atmosphere uh as we go into the larger legion story so um and i think those are perfectly valid and and i like those i actually i like those a lot when they when mm-hmm. he does those so yeah i think there are a number of ways so no, go ahead, jump, jump in. Give me some, some of your, which ones, which ones, uh, do you, you know, how, wherever you want to go to first. Well, the, the, the major one is, uh, cause we see this throughout several of the issues. Um, and this is, uh, the, the, the Proteans and whatever RJ Brand has to do with that. And, and, and I'm referring to the, uh, it's, it's, it comes across as the Proteans are, they're, they're wanting independence. They're wanting, recognition for their species and uh and somehow brand is involved with this perhaps um and we haven't got a resolution of that and i think that's if that is not something that is that becomes a major storyline uh i will i will be very upset with uh mr levitz and company because that something like that 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 we get that we've gotten teased over several issues now that has such huge ramifications within the universe uh i think is perhaps even more important (laughs) long term anyway than the other thing which i know is coming up uh in in future issues very soon but that's you know what what is universo up to and i included that uh as a major plot because we don't have a resolution to it and i know like i said it's it's you know it's it's part of the universal project storyline so there's that, uh, and then finally the, uh, the, the the other one is the the time barrier issues that we have just been introduced to essentially in the last I don't know a few issues that will have ramifications down the road by almost double the issue count uh, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly mm-hmm. maybe 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 uh, a little bit less than that but but you know it's going to be a while <laughs> before I think that actually comes. Uh, or we, we get a resolution to that. Yeah, I, I sort of put the, the protean uh, independence thing alongside of 
um, the Imsk rebellion that always seems to happen with Microlad. Yeah, you, you had you had added that, and I had totally missed that one. And that's yeah, that's another one that is that is very interesting. Uh, but we haven't gotten a whole lot on that. Right. Uh, one one mention specifically, maybe maybe another, but but it's definitely uh, just kind of hovering out in there in the ether. Uh, in the legion, so uh, yeah, it's it, are we are we seeing the 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 beginnings of some sort of dissolution of the united planets, hmm. or it's just a way to culturally make them different. You know, Star Trek likes mm-hmm. to make oh yeah, Star Trek makes all their cultures different just by wherever the special effects pieces on their face you know it's on their (laughs) nose it's on their ear it's on their chin it's on their brow but the legion has to do it a different way you know and i feel like that's really what sort of the long game is there There, i don't think there is a long game i think it's just whenever you bring up micro lad or whenever you bring up a pro protein it's like okay these are the things they're striving for and maybe it gets resolved off panel Mm. if at all Mm -hmm. And I've, as far as some minor things, uh, uh, I've already talked about the dream girl aspect. Cause I, I think that there's, there's really something there. Um, time will, will prove me wrong or right on that. Uh, I'm hoping right. <laughs> and then the, the other thing was, and, uh, this, you know, maybe you can educate me on this. Cosmic boy was, has been dropping a bunch of, uh, well, he he was he was saying things about you know his plans for the future and and whatnot. And I know part of that is that he was stepping back from his role in the Legion, and we've got the Cosmic Boy uh, miniseries coming up. But it seemed in the way that he was expressing this to various people in on the team that there was something else going on, or I have totally misunderstood it, and it's really just that Magnetic Kid is going to replace him on the team. Did I miss something? No, I think it was I think it was a bunch of things. I think it was his role in the Legion, which then which then led to the Trinity's role in the Legion, and they decided to become senior advisors, right? Um mm-hmm. the the and this this was part of the fun of this project that you that you put us on, where, you know, I would get to one issue and then you would see that subplot get continued later. And then, oh, right. Oh, so like Cosmic Boy saying that we need new blood or the team needs a shakeup is kind of opposite of Lightning Lad and Saturn Girl realizing that they're parents and they want to be a family. But how do you justify also wanting to be a member of the Legion, right? And then those two storylines kind of converged in issue, was it 12, I think, 11 or 12? where they're saying, okay, well, here's what we do. We become senior advisors, rotating senior advisors. That way we can all be part of the Legion, but we don't have to be members, more or less, right? But then what that then does is also speak to Cosmic Boy's other thing about we need to shake the team up, and the way to do that is new blood. And he talks to Wildfire about it. Um, He knows that, eventually he knows that the Trinity is going to leave, which is going to open up some avenues open up some spaces and um i think and then i think that's why you get the the whole five new members right is because of what what comes from cosmic boy's decision um get out the old bring in the new um so i think what the what you're sensing is right but i and i and i think it all pretty much is wrapped up uh, the only thing that's left is Cosmic Boy and Night Girl going on this vacation, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I think for what he had, what he had in store for the Legion, even though may have not, maybe it wasn't out, it wasn't set out right. Once he made the decision of I need to leave the team, oh look, so do the other two founders. Well, that means they need new blood, which is something I've been feeling like anyway. Um, I don't know if, uh, uh, but then also we become these special advisors. So I think, I think it was all of that. Yeah. It it might've been that, uh, because cosmic boy is one of my favorite characters. I was hoping for a little bit more involvement with, uh, from him in the story. 
Um, yeah, and, and like a lot but, of like we're finding with these plots, it all happens sort of behind the scenes. Mm, yeah, yeah. And and uh, while you were talking, it suddenly occurred to me too that we you know we get we get a convergence of some of these subplots, the cosmic boy aspect, and also the time barrier thing coming up because what happens what what cosmic boy discovers in his miniseries uh right. directly relates to that time barrier thing well, oh and actually th- that leads me into um how these again how these subplots connect so we go through all the cosmic boy stuff all the lightning lad and saturn girl how it affects the legion book but then once those once they decide to be reserve member or special advisors or whatever that then ties into Legionnaires 3, which also ties into Cosmic Boy, right? So, like, the whole mm, Time Trapper yes. stuff gets resolved, gets thrown in there. So, oh, right, yeah. So that's actually a subplot, <laughs> I think, that's been going on very successfully in the background um, and has led to two other miniseries, which is crazy, right? Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's a way that Levitz has, has kind of shown, you know, look, we can do more with this Legion. Um, now, some of the subplots in here, like... You know, Timberwolf going through and enacting Karate Kid's will gives us the character of Mig, who we will see later. Comic Queen has been getting a few appearances. We actually will see her later, too. So that's stuff that'll happen. Um, uh, but then, like, something like, oh, by the way, Timberwolf is rich. Well, what now what? I don't think yeah. I don't think we ever get that that again you know um but there's a there's a subplot and i think we talked about this i was hoping that timber wolf would come out of that story different than than the sad puppy that he's been Mm, you know and 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 if you mix that with the storyline with between him and ayla you know they had a resolution but not to his favor kind of hope that maybe he grows up a little bit more um, because he kind of reverted in a few issues that we read, which was disappointing. Mm -hmm. I I, I want something better for him. And this is a storyline that I don't know if it gets resolved or if we touch on any more. And so there's, that's like disappointing to me because I felt like Levitz was really pushing Timberwolf. So I guess. Well, well, exactly. And, and I, I think, I think what I've, mentioned this before but uh timberwolf is a favorite of his i think he i think he had that in one of the letter columns once and and then you know obviously at the more towards the top of the show i i mentioned what lytle said about timberwolf so obviously timberwolf is a very important character to some of the creators and yet yeah there's not a whole lot of real development of of that character so far um what else? Um, things that we talked about that we know is coming, you know, a little, maybe a little bit more between Shrinking Violet and Light Lightning Lass. I mean, that's that's we've, we've kind of talked about that a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I put on there that I think is just never going to be addressed, but it's just in the background is the Legion, the members relationship to the headquarters <laughs> and to Computo. Yeah, th- that was interesting. Yeah. That you, I, I, I read that. I'm like, oh yeah, that's that is something I've never really thought about. It's happened. It happened a few times in the tales issues too, where like Timberwolf would go to a door and it wouldn't open, or I think Dream Girl was like running through and she's like, why is this? Why are these headquarters so big? And every now and then, Computo kind of does something that's like a little weird and off. And I don't know if that's just Levitt saying, oh right, we just wanted to build this new headquarters because we were tired of the orange one, but we never really addressed it. And all the Legion members were like, Oh look, we got a new headquarters because Brainy said so, you know? Um, so again, I don't think it ever comes up, but that was something that's like one of those atmospheric subplots that um, I just always like to keep notice of. mon being agitated got resolved into his, issue 23 where he gets cured of his serum um mm-hmm. uh, invisible kids powers got resolved thankfully um yeah I, I think it i think it was it was good to see because it kind of it's a nice little checklist now that we can always keep going back to mm-hmm. uh to see were you gonna say something oh, i was 
you're just trying to give me more homework to do in the, in the future is all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's nice because I, I'm sure if we did this with Claremont's X-Men, that list would be huge. Oh, my God. And, I, I, I wouldn't even want to try. Right. And they, they hardly <laughs> ever get resolved. So. Well, I, I will say this at word. I'm going to delve out of the Legion just like you just did. Uh, but uh, because this is this is my touchstone, which is the New Teen Titans, because um, subplots w- would brew in that in that series for for some time. Right. Um, uh, not obviously we haven't examined those issue by issue <laughs> uh, together. But, you know, since you do um, you do uh, the, 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 the tower podcast examining the new teen titans run uh what's your assessment what's your comparison between what levitz is doing here in legion and what um wolfman was doing in new teen titans are they comparable is it is it is it it, what i'm wondering is is was subplot storytelling um uh basically the storytelling uh, device de jour at that time at DC Comics? Not to the level I think that Levitz and Wolfman did. Um, mm-hmm. I think with Wolfman, uh, a lot of people have said over the years, you know, he brought a lot of the mentality of the way to do Marvel comics uh, over to DC. Right. Um, I think he lucked out because he had only seven characters to deal with, whereas yeah. Levitz has 20 <laughs> plus. So. I think Levitz does a damn good job. Even if they don't always wrap up the way that I want, and mm-hmm. there are characters that are sidelined, I can't imagine anybody else doing better, you know, at this point. Yeah. Um, in fact, writers have tried to do better later, after Levitz, and to varying degrees of success, right? Um, so, but Wolfman, I mean, like I said, he only had seven characters, and, and he was able to... Um, I think he was able to really start and complete a lot of his storylines um, because he didn't have to deal with so many characters. And, and 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 it's not like the rest of the DC Universe was poking into either of these franchises, you know? If anything, people wanted New Teen Titans in their book. It, Wolfman and Perez didn't have to have those characters in their book, right? Cause they were already the big dogs. So, um, so yeah, so I think he, I think he did fine. If I did this with the Titans, I think a lot of the storylines would wrap up and they would wrap up sooner than with Levitz, unless it was something that was planned to be a long, uh, process like the whole Terra thing with Judas contract. So, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's just, those Bronze Age writers who wanted to no longer write the way Julius Schwartz wrote comics, mm-hmm. you know, they wanted to write them different ways. And, and I think I found that even going back to those Karate Kid projector issues, some of those early Levitt stuff still sort of ringing the same way the, the writers previous to him were, were writing the Legion. But then you get into like Great Darkness and After and the 300s and it's like, oh, Suddenly, Giffen gets, not only is he an artist, but now he's also co-writer. And his artwork changes, and the feel of the book changes, and it gets even more futuristic. And it's not just about heroes versus villains. It's about, you know, some other concepts. So, um, yeah. Again, I think that's Paul Levitt's unsung hero of the 80s with this book. Mm. It uh, it occurred to me... uh, as well that speaking of subplots at DC comics, uh, there was the Mayfair DC comics role-playing game that had already come out at this point, uh, at the point that, uh, issue 27 had been published. And I remember, cause I, I got that game and, uh, I remember that subplots having subplots for your characters for, or for your player characters, uh, was a big part of that role playing game. They they had a, a, a section devoted to that, to how to develop those things for your, for the for your players. So yeah, that was it was certainly something in the air at DC Comics at the time. Okay, two hours in. Let's go to our back half of of the episode. Um, 
where we talk about the Legion of Superheroes in other DC comics, um, starting with Who's Who, number 20, where we have the characters of Saturn Girl, Saturn Queen, Sensor Girl, Shadow Lass, uh, one, two, three, four, yeah, four, all directly related to the Legion of Superheroes. Um, so let's start with, um, let's start with Saturn Girl. Yeah. So Saturn Girl, uh, art by Kurt Swan and Carl Kessel. Peter, you have, you've mentioned many times, uh, as we have been going through these issues about the logos and, uh, for some reason, or not for some reason, because of that, I am now paying more attention to the, to the logos of these characters <laughs> and, uh, boy, Boring, boring logos, mostly uh, for these entries in Who's Who. Yeesh. It's like they didn't even bother with it mm. at this point. At issue 20, they're no, no longer concerned about having individualized logos for these characters. Probably the only th- I didn't really learn too much from the Saturn Girl stuff entry. Um, I did. Uh, so one of the things here, uh, they talk about R.J. Brand emulating... The Legion of Superheroes off of uh, Superboy and Supergirl. But obviously in publishing chronology, the Legion of Superheroes actually predate Supergirl. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously an origin point that uh, um, gets latched on later. Um, I love that there's just like this casual mention that Validus is their son. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I read that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Was this a spoiler at the time? Uh, so I had to go back and look. And so I th- according to what I found, and uh, I might be wrong about this. So this issue of Who's Who preceded annual number two, uh, annual two by a week. So, yes, on the spoiler thing, I guess. Oh, I mean, we, I mean, I'll, I'll, we as readers we, know. We know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She doesn't know. Right. But see, at first I thought, because uh, I'd forgotten that we'd already covered this in a previous annual uh, Tales, because um, we, yeah, we the reader knew this because of the reveal uh, in that, that other annual, but, you know, it's like the characters don't. But, uh, yeah, that I thought that was re- just, just a fun little uh, trivia bit, though, that's, you know, that, that when these issues came out. And then the other thing that I uh, I'll add to this was it says here that she that Saturn Girl held two terms as leader and considered one of the best. And uh, unfortunately, I don't really have a context for that because I haven't read a whole lot of uh, of the the stories in which she was leader. Mm-hmm. But you, but we do see like you know she is she is uh, maybe revered is too strong of a word, but she is held in high regard by the team, um, not just because she's the founder, obviously, but, uh, you know, I, I assume that that leadership time uh, and her leadership qualities uh, plays into that. But it's just, I don't know, it's just one of those things that they, they, they throw out there, but they, I don't know that they necessarily show it. They tell us, but they show it. They don't show it. Yeah, it's Legion lore at this point, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting to see the Kurt Swan image, but not have the bikini era suit shown anywhere on this image. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, you're right. Well, that leads me to uh, Saturn Queen, mm-hmm. because the the one thing that I uh, liked about the art, and this is by Dan Jurgens and Bob Oxner, um, it's... Saturn Queen, you know, she's she's the the uh, the dark reflection of Saturn Girl, right? Uh, in, in in various ways, and her costume kind of reflects that. At least the the uh, the kind of the older version of Saturn Girl's costume with the with the you know the Silver Age version, I should say. Um, so I I don't know I I just I really like the 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 construction and color of Saturn Girl's costume. Right. Or, sorry, Saturn Queen's costume. She's such an interesting character that I have very little experience with, and I, I'm mm-hmm. I'm almost afraid to delve into it because I'm afraid I'm going to be disappointed in what I yeah. in what I find. 
<laughs> this this Saturn Queen. Well, you know, all of them: uh, Saturn Queen, Lightning Lightning Lord, and uh, Cosmic King. There's such possibilities with those characters that that hasn't been explored yet. Uh, and you know, they've they've showed up already, and we've we've talked before. You know, because you've brought this up about the uh, the the time travel aspect of these characters and when they actually met the Legion for the first time and all that kind of stuff, the timey wimey stuff. Um, but yeah, I, for, for a, 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 a telepath of her demeanor, <laughs> I'll just say, um, there, she could be a, a very formidable opponent of the Legion, generally speaking, and they don't really play her that way. Right. She's she's more of a she's a supporting character to the other, um, uh, I don't know what to, what what do we call those those three collectively? Oh, I don't know the opposite tr- the dark trinity. <laughs> yeah, the dark <laughs> trinity. There we go. <laughs> good, good. Well, they even say it in her entry, which I like, where they're, where they're like, you know, they claim to be. Uh, uh, let's see. These were the older villains claiming to have come to the Legion's time from their own future. It is unknown whether these claims are true. So, again, Levitt's kind of saying, since some of those stories dealt with, like, Superman or the adult Legion, who knows? Who -hmm. knows who they are, you know? How can Lightning Lord be from the future if he's Lightning Lad's older brother? Right? Yeah. So... So she's she's like the only one left that they haven't done anything with, and I don't know if they will. Uh, Shadow Lass, Shadow Lass, and Sensor Girl, both done by Steve Lytle, Be- beautifully drawn by Steve Lytle. Just to keep that love going. Um, oh yeah, wait, Sensor Girl's first. Sorry, I jumped. Sensor Girl, yeah. I, you know why I yeah, did that? that? Because I didn't write notes on Sensor Girl at the time because I wanted to read the issue first ah. and then do the who sometimes I do the who's who first. I was like, oh don't don't do the who's who yet. So yeah, let's go to Sensor Girl first. Sorry. Well I I totally dig the the Steve Lytle art with because it's it's got it's kind of got a red red blue yellow theme going on through here with with her and their costume and then the the, the background images which are the two tone. Which, which is normally rare. I was I was gonna say it's it's not normal, right? Because it's usually just one tone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. But you know, it's the everything that is the the reddish tone is Projectra. Well, no, no that's not true. <laughs> they kind of uh, they kind of mix it up. Yeah, they mix it up a little bit. That's that's unfortunate. Uh, it doesn't matter, but it, it, it's it's a very nice looking page, at least from a from a color perspective. I like that a lot. And he gets in, you know, the death of Karate Kid. He gets in Brainiac 5, which has really been a thing for Sensor Girl. He throws in Quizlet just because. Um, but she looks great. She looks great. It wasn't much that I learned from the entry itself, that we, especially after reading all those issues. Um, it's pretty much a lot of the stuff we talked about. Orando being a princess, falling in love. Doing the penance thing. There, there was something in here though. Uh, under alter ego, she's listed simply as Projectra. And so, uh, is that is that truly her name? So that the king and queen of Orando had this girl, and and they're like, oh, uh, we're going to name her Projectra, and then she has these illusion casting powers on on top of it so i don't know just a little maybe two on the nose <laughs> you know what you know was she able to cast illusions as a baby um uh, you know what 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 there's uh, i'm i'm getting into the minutia of of this i know but it's just like this is this is weird that they it's it's very, it's a very i i guess very silver agey thing right yeah. to name to name a character based on their actual power or abilities, right? Well, I just and I just realized that I thought Jackie was her name, but that's a nickname for Projectra. Yeah. Jackie, Jectra. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so mm-hmm. dumb. 
I thought she had a real name. I thought Jackie was a real name. It was like short for something. Well, that that's kind of what I mean is that I'm I'm surprised that she, you know, cuz it seemed to me that Princess Projector was an honorific. Yeah, right. And I expected her to have an actual name, and yet that's not what we get here. So, interesting, I guess. I think she does later. I just I just I just like I said, I just always thought Jackie was the thing. Oh, that's so funny. And then uh under the powers it says something about her being able to sense temperature. Yeah, okay. So it says here, um, this ability makes her sensitive to other information at a distance. As a normal person can sense a change in temperature in her room, she can sense temperature changes on a whole world. Or can she or or she can literally smell a change in the air. So I don't we haven't seen her use the that part of her ability, right? I think with the regular stuff, didn't that happen? She's, I thought she sensed. Oh no, she was she was kidnapped at that point. I thought there was somewhere where she she did do the drop in temperature and got colder or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, I just thought that was a, perhaps a, a little a, a tidbit of information that is potentially new, or we haven't really seen much of it. So you know, we'll given that they've they've <laughs> devoted some. Um, column space to it that i would hope that we would see a little bit more about that in the future and then lastly shadow last also by steve lionel beautiful drawing love the way he draws i there. i love the way yeah i love the way that he draws or drew uh shadow last yeah and at least here they kind of you know messed around with the logo a little bit <laughs> so it's not it doesn't it's not just kind of the same as everybody else's so First member to win membership on the battlefield. Yep. Um, that was, I think that was one of my first, uh, it wasn't my first Legion Legion story, but it was really close uh, when I bought that uh, Treasury Edition reprint. And that's, you know, I, I read that story um, over and over to the, to the point where that Treasury Edition is basically falling apart now and it was already it was already um uh old and and well read when i got it so yeah says that her first mission was against or with the fatal five i it it made me wish that levitz included her in the whole fatal Mm -hmm. five battle you know since she has history um i wrote she and i go ahead oh go ahead no, you go ahead. Oh, she she brings light to the darkness in Monel's soul. I thought that was a nice little ooh, yeah, nice little, little touch poetic, there, yeah. poetic there, yeah. Um, uh, I had forgotten. Uh, there's something in here about her crush on Brainiac Five. Uh, that you know that was she was more interested in Brainiac Five at one point, and and so uh, knowing that, um, uh, that scene or we've got, we got a few scenes in some issues recently oh, where right. yeah. she. She's concerned about Brainiac Five, and I remember I remember asking a question: Why is she uh, um, showing this concern for Brainiac Five? Right, and now it totally makes sense. <laughs> See, can't doubt the Levitts. Uh, I also like the way Lytle draws her; makes her look a little uh, elf-like, elfin-like yes. with the ears yeah. and the eyebrows <laughs> and the face. It make, yeah, it makes her look just a little bit alien. Right. She's just not, you know, it's just not a human that has blue skin. You know, she's, yeah. she's got something else going on. Yes. Yeah, I wish I wish uh, other other artists would, would pick up on those kind of cues and carry them over. And then in her power description, which, you know, it makes sense, but I, because really, what is shadow? Like, you know, can you control shadow? They say... She can uh, project vast quantities of darkness in the form of a negative energy that absorbs visible light frequencies uh, and surrounding parts of the spectrum. So, you know, it's not that she's blanketing uh, an area. She's absorbing, it's it's this negative energy that goes out and absorbs the, you know, so it's like a little different than what I guess I thought shadow casting would be like, Mm -hmm. or maybe I just never thought of it, you know? And I don't, I don't recall them actually using her power in that way. It's, it's usually just, 
she darkens the room as if as if the uh, a light source is covered as opposed to absorbing uh the light sources and then eventually although i guess i sorry i guess i, I guess technically that it, that's exactly what a shadow or what what a uh wow the result of a sh- I don't, okay we're well, getting into science stuff that i don't know so never mind <laughs> well, let's no, just skip because, that like think of like a tall <laughs> building a tall building casts a shadow like that mm-hmm. it's not it's not really sucking up light it's just no yeah you're right it's, okay you know that so so that's why i thought like how to okay so what is shadow casting eventually dc will have a whole thing about you know a whole darkness dimension right a dark dimension mm. where shadow dimension where all these people pull from oh, yeah that's you know, right obsidian and shadow thief and um you you name it. i think marvel has one too uh, with cloak and cloak from cloak and dagger and mm-hmm. dark mm-hmm. star etc so um yeah i guess I, I just never really thought of it in those terms it was kind of interesting to read here at the, in the who's who well and then you know if that's if that's the case then how does well, how does that impact her relationship with with other characters like sun boy or wildfire for that matter you know if if her ability absorbs those energies then theoretically she can she can not just negate their abilities but maybe in wildfire's case maybe um have some sort of uh adverse reaction <laughs> because imagine he her, is he is energy imagine her well, going he's an- against a green lantern oh yeah exactly ooh ooh yeah the possibilities here <laughs> <laughs> she can if she can absorb visible light frequencies and surrounding parts of the spectrum such as infrared and ultraviolet i mean that's you know what what planet is she is she from talus talic eight talic yeah so just get a, an army of uh well i know it's not that's not how uh this works on on her planet but get a get a bunch of talokians and and you've you've essentially gotten rid of the uh the the spectrum groups in the DC universe, do they all have it, or is it just because in no, yeah. yeah, it's just it's just her and her, her cousin, cousin, yeah, yeah. So she kind of lucks out, right? Because she's she's one of, she's not one of many like Polar Boy or or who else, even even Cosmic Boy, right? Don't they all have mm-hmm. powers? Yeah, to some degree. Yeah, a lot. Of, yeah, most of the the members come from worlds filled with these people. So. Yeah. But she's got which that is champion lineage. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. See, here's another <laughs> another possibility of uh, developing someone, developing a character uh, on the in the group that has so much potential here, and already has a great backstory and lots of of uh, stuff to pull from to to make her more of a. Uh, a force to be reckoned with on the team. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we get that. Mm-hmm. I think we get it more with her ancestor Lydia Mallow, you know, back in the oh yes Legion book yeah. than we do Shadow Rise. But she's one of my favorite characters. Um, more so, I think maybe for the design, because like I said, she hasn't done much in the twenty-seven issues we've read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's she's Monel's girlfriend. Oh. <laughs> Okay, um, so that's who's who number twenty. Obviously, we'll do uh, who's who number twenty one. Should make note in the editorial that they said the book was going, the who's who was going to jump from twenty four to twenty six issues. Um, they mention a Star Trek spinoff, um, followed by Superman, but obviously that never happened, and then possibly Legion, which does happen. I'm sure we'll take a look at. That. That when that comes out and all the updates, etc. I don't understand why they never did the Superman one. I don't think they could because if if Byrne is just starting out, how do you who do you include, right? Because, oh, you're right. Yeah, right, it was a clean slate. If they wanted to do pre crisis, they could have got they could have done twelve issues if not more. Hmm. Um. So they did the Legion. I know they mentioned Green Lantern, but that just seems kind of redundant because everybody's a Green Lantern. <laughs> but really, all you're doing is just talking about their their human I- or their um, secret identities or their other mm-hmm. identities. Titans they could have done, but I guess maybe they felt the spotlight was more 
that was they wanted to do the Teen Titans spotlight and do actual stories, not just who's who. Of course, yeah. we did get the I forget when, but we did get the a bunch of annuals with with the who's who entries. Those are those were always fun to collect, and like I said, updates and deluxe editions, etc. And then eventually, secret files, which sort of became the new who's who. I love all those. Those are great, too. Let's go elsewhere in the DC Universe. Booster Gold number 9, the second chapter to the uh, guest-starring appearance of the Legion of Superheroes, Brainiac 5, Ultra Boy, and Chameleon Boy, as they go back in time to try to figure out why does Booster Gold have a Force Belt, a Brainiac 5 Force Belt? Why does he have a Legion Ring? They think he's going to assassinate the... uh, President and Vice President, President Reagan and Vice President Bush. But there's another assassination, I mean, assassin in the background. This chapter, pretty much uh, a big fight book Mm -hmm. (laughs) until they decide to actually pay attention to each other, stop the assassin, rescue the president, the vice president, make sure time is all not messed with, make sure that the belt remains back in the 1980s so that Booster can find it in the 25th century. Um, We get some mentions here and there of DC's future. I thought this was the most interesting thing of the whole issue, where um, not Jack Kirby's great disaster, but another disaster will happen, a nuclear disaster, which sets up the Hex miniseries uh, that's going on Mm -hmm. at this time. So DC connecting Legion and Booster Gold and Hex, like we've been talking about for a couple episodes. Apparently that disaster happens in the year 2045. So we are not far off from, I guess, our universe blowing up. Um, Oh, boy. (laughs) I don't know. We got pretty close this uh, uh, in 2020, so. Um. And then, uh, you know, that's this, this issue sort of wraps up the Booster Gold origin story where he's so nervous um, for sa- from saving the president that when the president asks him what's his name, he says, Booster, no, Gold. And the president's like, oh, Booster Gold, where he really wanted to be called Gold Star. Yeah, I, when I read that, I, I did not know this. Um, all the years I've been reading DC Comics, I knew there was a Gold Star character that mm-hmm. showed up later in Booster Gold. It's his sister. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I I did not realize that that was what the character intended to be uh, his name, his superhero name. So I thought that was a fun little uh, bit of trivia, too. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the second chapter was not as entertaining as the first chapter was. Mm. In fact, I sort of felt like the second chapter, I was like, whoa, this is an 80s comic, but it has it has like 60s, 70s dialogue in it, you know, just way too on the nose ultra boys dialogue was like you know, I, I just I, I didn't enjoy it I, not as yeah, much as it's, the first chapter you can definitely tell the difference in uh, writers in terms of the words coming out of these characters mouths when you when you can compare them like 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 we are it's yeah it's very clear that uh, Levitz has a, a handle on the characters that other other writers may not yet (laughs) right well they don't get a chance to right (laughs) that's true yeah if you're writing justice league you get to write batman superman or whoever you know um alongside of their solo titles but when it's a team book they don't really get spread especially the legion they don't get spread out as much yeah but but i do like I, i have enjoyed how um uh, that the the Legion characters have this connection to Booster Gold and vice versa. How they set that up, I don't know. I don't know if the 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 uh, the idea came from Jurgens or if it was developed collectively or whatever. But I but I love at that time. It would, even though I didn't read Booster Gold then, but now going back, you know, some decades later and 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 comparing these two titles together. Um, how 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 uh, interactive they are, and 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 uh, I, I I just really dig that. That's that's just a cool thing that they did for a a book, a team, the Legion. That because they are so far in the future, you know, they rarely get played with in the main DCU. 
And what's funny is it kind of all cycles back to Bendis' Legion, right? Where Booster played a part in, <laughs> so, on, in some de- to some degree, you know, into the buildup of what would become the Legion. So mm-hmm. very cyclical there. And this issue has a has an appearance by Rose Forrest in her Rose identity, Rose and Thorn, as she works for Booster Gold. So, Wait a minute. The blonde. Are you suggesting that this is where Bendis got the idea for Rose? I don't. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know, she's been popping up in this Booster Gold run for a while as a background character to Metropolis, and you know. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> not like he did anything with her. Yeah. Uh, and then the only other sort of little fun fact with this issue is it's interesting to see Reagan and Nancy Reagan. Because in the DC Universe in a couple of years, we learn that Nancy Reagan is a Manhunter sleeper agent. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. I did not know this. During Millennium. Uh, she pops up every now and then because Reagan was once Frank Miller put Reagan into the Dark Knight Returns series. Suddenly he Reagan just starts showing up everywhere. Like he shows up Mm. with Burn and Superman and Legends, obviously. Um, Normally comic books like to create their own president, but they didn't do that with Reagan. Um, and he shows up a little every now and then. I think he shows up with, like, Captain Adam or something like that, uh, congratulating the heroes, you know, for winning. And then in the background, you see, like, Nancy Reagan just sitting there, and then there's a little glint of reflection off of her metal eye. And you're like, oh, she's a manhunter. <laughs> <laughs> so it wow. was funny to see her here. Not that they knew it at the time, but I, I like to think there's a connection. <laughs> um, and then we go to Superpowers Volume 3, Number 2, which has been, uh, you know, it's been having a tier appearance, tier from the uh, Legion of Superheroes, Legion of Super Villains, only because they were selling him off as a toy with his big old mm-hmm. honking arm. Yes, as as I after I read that that appearance or that issue, I was thinking um, I, I now think of Tear like Tear the alien with a screwdriver arm. <laughs> <laughs> what did you? Was there anything to take away from, from no, this issue? No, not at no, all. No, right? <laughs> He's, it's just uh, yeah, that's that's a horrible horrible series. <laughs> yeah, he makes an appearance. I mean, I really don't yes. know what else to say. This, yeah, yeah, exactly. We talked about superpowers last issue, last episode. Um, uh, some of the other volumes and all that, you know, this volume uh, just doesn't, just doesn't, uh, <laughs> it just doesn't. <laughs> I don't know mm-hmm. what else to say. It's so clearly a tie-in. Um, it's a tie-in not only to the books, but then also the uh, the cartoon at the time too. So like that little star-shaped teleportation thing. Um, which was a boom tube in the cartoon. That's the design they used. They used the star shape to it. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, and of course, having Dark Side and, and Desaad in there, and you know, we get Captain Marvel in this issue, and Plastic Man, Cyborg, just everybody that they're throwing into the toy lines, and that damn arm on tier. Oh, he, I mean, he just he does a bunch of stuff. You know, he does. A, a bunch of stuff with it but it's so clearly like keep showing that arm keep showing that arm because that's what the toys do Mm -hmm. so it's an odd choice um well i mean i guess it's not so odd if you're if you're thinking about toys and like which one of our characters could benefit from being a toy okay you have this thing this character whose arm can pop off well it's kind of ripe for being a toy, you know, mm-hmm. short of losing yeah. like. But but surely he's not the only character that that has shown up in DC Comics, uh, and he's such a minor villain in the Legion. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very curious why they went with him as opposed to some other character or or 
You know, I, I you know, I, I could just if this were done years later, I could just imagine a young Mark Wade um tasked with identifying a bunch of characters to to include in this, and he would definitely pull out Tyr as a as a as an option. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing about, you know, getting Mr. Free so they can freeze Dark Side and you know, it's like, What? Really? Okay. So there you go. That's about it, as much we can talk about that book. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. That yeah. brings us to the end of another electrifying, mesmerizing <laughs> Legion Project episode. I, I want the listeners to know that before we press the record button, um, uh, Peter and I were talking about, well, how much? How much is there really to talk about about this issue? And as always, we we surprise ourselves at how long we can fill out a Legion Project podcast episode, <laughs> despite the uh, pr- apparent um, thinness of the issue. <laughs> if we didn't have all these other books to talk about, we would actually get like you know hour long episodes, probably. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Whose fault is that, Peter? Mine. Hmm? Such a taskmaster. <laughs> it's it's no fault. It's it's an awesome awesome thing to do. Yeah. Um. Definitely want to thank everybody who's been saying, you know, where's the next episode? Here's the next episode. So enjoy it. Go slowly through it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Play it at half speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Split it up. Split it up into chunks so you you have it over time. Um. And anybody who's emailed or or tweeted or or retweeted you know always always super appreciative um for the support for this episode for this podcast um we should talk real quick before we go next episode will be a tales of the legion project episode where we will be taking a look at the next book in chronological publishing order which is legion of the superhero legion of superheroes annual number two of the Baxter run, which is a sequel to The Curse, an, uh, an annual that we talked about in episode number three, actually. So, you know, you can make the, you can talk about subplots, you can go from the Great Darkness Saga to uh, Legion of Superheroes annual number three from the regular line. And then all the way up to here, Legion of Superheroes annual number two. So that'll be the next episode. Uh, in our Tales format. And then after that, we may do a second Tales episode, just to kind of give ourselves a little bit of a break from the main title. Um, but we, and we don't, we're not sure what that'll be, but we'll talk about what that is uh, amongst ourselves, and then you'll, you'll get that eventually. So you'll probably be getting two Tales episodes before we go to Legion of Superheroes number 28. Um, for those of you playing along with us and you know that we like to dig into these other titles like Who's Who and, like I said, Booster Gold. Eric, we'll have to talk about whether we're going to keep up with Booster Gold because I think that's it. I don't really think there's a, anything else Legion related. Hmm. So um, we might be done with that. Um, even if I check on it on my own, I doubt we'll include it. Um we have the Cosmic Boy miniseries coming up. One of the things we're going to add as a way to talk about Legion, the Legion elsewhere is um, DC at this time has released the title known as Secret Origins. I believe it's the second volume of Secret Origins that they ever released by this time. And every now and then we get a Legion story. So I believe it's with next issue the issue number 28 we can talk about secret origins number eight a uh, a story about shadow lass shadow lass's origin speaking of her mm-hmm. who's who stuff i remember that yeah yeah so here's a way to bring in other titles um they don't do it in every issue but anytime they do a legion story we will talk about it and then the other big event after crisis was legends uh, the Le- Cosmic Boy specifically plays a part in Legends, so it might be fun to include that in our regular 
episodes just to see if there's any connection. Maybe they talk about the time stuff. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, the Cosmic Boy miniseries will be its own episode. It'll be its own Tales episode. But I think Legends we can probably dip into. And I don't think it'll take up much time to talk about each issue when it, when it comes to the Legion's involvement anyway. So, just more stuff for Eric to read. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Anything else, Eric? I think I think we're done. Okay. All right. So, uh, if you want to reach out, send an email, peter at thedailyrios.com. Or longboxreview at gmail.com. We will talk to you soon. And uh, please be safe. And as always, long Long live live the the Legion Legion Project Project Podcast. Podcast. See ya. Bye, Peter.